Okay, so I know what you guys are saying right off the bat. Rob, Namor is not from Atlantis in the MCU. He's from a whole different place. And that's true to a degree. But by the end of this video, I think you're going to basically say the same thing that I am, which is, yeah, like either they're going to discover Atlantis or they're going to rediscover Atlantis. But whatever the case is, that's where Namor is going to end up taking residence, assuming they don't kill him. And I don't think they will because he's another mutant they're adding to the MCU. So he's basically going to become a main star in the MCU later on down the line. So let's explain Atlantis. Let's talk about Namor's kingdom, right? Because when the time comes that we inevitably get there, you guys want to be experts on him. So here's the thing. In Marvel Comics, Atlantis has a very, very lengthy history, but it also doesn't at the same time. So the entire nature behind Atlantis goes back to really the age of the Celestials. Before that, in Marvel Comics, you do have some stories, some old Fantastic Four stories. You do have things like Tales of Atlantis. But one of the things that Marvel does is they have stories that contradict other stories. And so it's hard to know what's accurate and what's not. The only real distinctive thing that we know for sure when it came to Atlantis was basically everything from the Great Cataclysm, or at least around the time of the Great Cataclysm, going forward. So the way this works in Marvel Comics, and it's a little bit different from the MCU, although we still don't know the full history of the Celestials, so there's a lot to be explored there. In the early days of Earth, the Celestials had visited the planet like they'd done so many others, and conducted an experiment on the early days of humanity. They were technically called the Wanderers, so you might refer to them as the missing link between primate man and modern man, but it was basically a small subsect of humanity. One group was turned into, into Eternals, one group was turned into Deviants, and then the third group had their genes modified so that at some point in time, they would basically manifest, i.e. the basis or the origin behind the mutant population in Marvel Comics. Now again, we don't necessarily know exactly how that'll translate in the MCU. We know the Eternals are a little bit different, but we don't even really know their full history or even if what they were told was true by the Celestials, because Arish and the Judge kind of seems like a dick. So the thing about this is that in the early days, when the Celestials visited Earth, of course, creating the Eternals, the Deviants, and then modifying the genes of baseline humans, the Eternals were basically angelic, right? They were everything that you would consider to be the peak of human potential, meaning they had the ability to tap into cosmic energies, they could fly, they had super strength, speed, all that kind of stuff. Very Superman-esque in terms of their abilities. But with the Celestials knowing that the Deviants, due to their destabilized genes and their lack of intelligence, would ultimately fall prey to human nature, which is to say, to wage war against others, the Deviants would would eventually try to conquer the Earth. And so to ensure that didn't happen, the Celestials tasked the Eternals with basically keeping the Earth protected and keeping the Deviants at bay. The Eternals didn't do that. They had their own civil war, which led to Titan, which led to like Thanos and Eros and all that kind of stuff. But because of the fact that the Eternals were basically derelict in their duties, when the Celestials arrived a second time on Earth to basically check up on their experiment, they realized that the Deviants had conquered the Earth, the Eternals had ignored the charter that was given to them, and humanity was for the most part turned into slaves. And so what this did is it led to the Deviants attacking the Celestials, believing the Celestials were encroaching on their territory. The Celestials, of course, obliterated pretty much all the Deviants, pushed them to the brink of extinction, but during that time, they sunk Atlantis in what's called the Great Cataclysm. Now, having said all of that, for Atlantis itself, it was kind of a neutral territory, right? That where you had places like Lumeria, which was the capital city of the Deviants, where you had Olympia, which was the capital city of the Eternals, not to be confused with the Greek god capital Olympia. Olympus, where you had these different places that were ruled by these two groups. For the most part, Atlantis was neutral because it was a trading hub. If you lived in a part of a world and you had things that you needed, Atlantis was where you went. And one of the things that I do want to establish, the Deviants did not conquer the entirety of the world. There were still sections of it where you had free men. And because Atlantis was neutral due to the fact that their king would literally capture and kill anybody who tried to start war in Atlantis, which was ironic because the king was a warmonger and always trying to expand the sphere of Atlantis against the Deviants and the Eternals. Because that would happen, nobody wanted to be a party to it, right? Nobody wanted to be captured or killed. And so it was basically kind of like hands off, right? Do your thing. And then when you leave, the war's back on again, right? That kind of a situation. But once Atlantis sunk, there were two major things that happened. The first is that not every citizen, not every human or even person who was in Atlantis died. That some of those individuals survived. And in fact, some of them remained within the capital city of Atlantis itself. What this meant is that when it sunk and went underwater, the various, you know, sorcerers and so on within Atlantis basically cast magical spells that allowed them to breathe underwater. Over time, their bodies began to evolve and they ultimately took on the kind of blue skin form that you see in Marvel Comics from time to time when it comes to the Atlanteans and they basically resided there. The other thing that happened is that during the Great Cataclysm, chunks of Atlantis broke off. 
off, which basically meant that some of those individuals who were in the Kingdom of Atlantis actually ended up taking up residence in some of the surrounding territories. The two most important when it comes to that are Avalon and Ruta. And the reason why that matters is because in Avalon, you basically had a woman who gave birth to a daughter named Morgan. Morgan eventually learned the art of magic, sorcery, so on and so forth. And she went on to become one of the most powerful practitioners of sorcery in Marvel Comics, oftentimes rivaling Doctor Strange and using the name Morgan Le Fay. In terms of Ruta, that was ridiculously important because on that island was a guy named Mirrodin, who was actually an enemy of Morgan for a period of time. But Mirrodin ended up leaving Ruta, traveling to England, joining King Arthur, and changing his name to Merlin. So that's kind of where, where you know, why those two little things are, are important in that way. But for the larger part and the bigger discussion here, if we really want to invoke the MCU and talk about the nature of, uh, of, of Namor the Submariner, one of the things that we learned recently that we covered in Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four is that in Antarctica, under Vostok Lake is actually a tribe of Atlanteans. And when we ended up learning about that, what Marvel did is they came back and they said, okay, so the way this worked is Atlanteans didn't just flee to the surrounding islands of Atlantis that somehow survived, that what other Atlanteans did is they actually took off to Thuria. And Thuria is basically the general name given for the Earth as it existed at the time, which was basically just Pangaea, right? Just a giant landmass that kind of surrounded Atlantis. But by modern standards, you would call it like Europe, Asia, the American Americas, that kind of a thing. And so what it did is it basically led to these individual humans who survived kind of traveling around and sort of interbreeding with humanity and then just kind of losing their Atlantean heritage. But for some groups, they totally left Atlantis, right? They literally just fled. They ran as fast as they could during the Great Cataclysm and they took up residence in other parts of the world. But because of the fact that they were so isolated and they were so well hidden for hundreds of thousands of years, nobody even knew they existed. More so than that, they didn't know the surface world was still intact. They didn't know that there were still land masses where people dwelled and like humanity was building and growing. That's why during Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four run during the Prime Element storyline, Susan Storm discovers the Atlanteans down there and they seem incredibly unaware of everything that's going on because they lived in isolation and they weren't the only ones, right? Like the War of the Four Cities, like they weren't the only ones that were there. There were other Atlantean tribes like that that did that out in the world. And that brings us to this discussion about Namor the Submariner in the MCU. If I'm a betting man, right, I'd bet all the money in my pockets to all the money in your pockets, which I currently have none in my pockets, <laughs> that what's going to happen here is that Namor the Submariner is going to be an Atlantean or descended from an Atlantean tribe that takes place or exists out there in that part of the world, but they're literally a branch off from the greater Atlantean group, and that he may very well be like the rightful heir to the throne of Atlantis or something along those lines. The reason why I say this is because as most of you guys know, you go back and you look at the, the ending of Iron Man 2, right? You got the map behind Nick Fury. There's a giant just like beacon out there in the Atlantic Ocean, exactly where Atlantis would be. Now, it could be the Marvel Cinematic Universe is ignoring that. They're just not really worried about that anymore. It's like, well, that's, that's old hat and we've changed things since then. Or it could be that they're borrowing a page out of Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four run, where the tribe of Namor the Submariner and their part of the world was so well hidden, nobody knew they existed. Not even S.H.I.E.L.D. knew they existed. And that kind of makes sense, right? Like a giant landmass under the Atlantic Ocean, if you're S.H.I.E.L.D. and you have all the world's intelligence at your disposal, you can probably spot it pretty easily, right? Especially if there's like beings moving around there and they have blood and warm bodies, maybe just like literally heat vision on a super deep scale would tell you that, right? But when it comes to somewhere like South America, there's tons of people moving around there. And so it would effectively be almost impossible to discern the difference between people moving on land and people moving under the ground. And so as a result of that, they could stay exceedingly well hidden. Now, again, we don't know how far reaching this is going to be. I'm just kind of throwing this theory out there, just kind of giving you guys my, my opinion on it. And so having not seen Black Panther 2, that's what I think is going to happen. That Namor the Submariner is going to be a guy that rules a part of the world where you have what are in effect Atlanteans, but they are part of what is a larger tribe. They simply just don't know it. Either that or Atlantis doesn't exist in the traditional sense. They're ignoring Iron Man too. But this kingdom that, that Namor rules is basically Atlantis by a different name. That's entirely possible as well. And honestly, that might make more sense. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Let me know what you think down in the comment section. Thank you all for watching. I will catch you all later. Peace.